is my Lord and my God, and we are in part two of this little sermon series that we're uh, working through in, in John chapter one, verses one through five, my Lord and my God. And in that, those verses that open John's gospel, the Bible says, beginning in verse one, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God, and all things were made through him, and without him, nothing was made that was made, and in him was life. And the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. This is a glorious opening to John's gospel. This, this prologue, just a glorious opening. Uh, probably the most profound opening statements of any piece of literature in all of history. This is a very profound opening to John's gospel. And it begs the question, what do you think about Jesus Christ? What do you think about Christ? Who is he? Many people over the centuries have answered that question in many varied ways. And it's one of the most important questions that you'll ever have to answer it. And that's the key. You're going to have to answer it. Based on his own words, Christ can only be considered a liar or a lunatic or Lord. And you must contend with one of those three choices. Most just avoid dealing with the question altogether. And to avoid it, you avoid it at your own peril. You answer that question, the answer to that question for you will be inescapable. You will answer the question sooner or later. And that answer, the answer to that question demands a response. Now John here in the opening verses of this chapter knows the answer to that question. And he wants you and I to know the answer to that question. And in this, we find again the purpose for John's writing. And it coincides with John chapter 20, verse 31, where he says that he is writing that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. Now, are you being asked here to believe without evidence? Is that believing spoken of by John in these opening verses referring to a blind faith, a faith that you simply believe without reason, without intellect, divorced from evidence? No, that's not the case at all. There is evidence to this faith, and you're being compelled by John in these verses to examine the evidence. You're being asked to consider the facts by an eyewitness to those facts. This is eyewitness testimony. Faith, saving faith, is believing based on the evidence and then acting on what you say you believe so that you might profess with Thomas, my Lord and my God. The Gospel of John is eyewitness testimony. And this eyewitness, John, is going to teach us about who Christ is. Few words here, and yet inexpressible, profound, as the hymnist says, ineffably sublime. This is an awesome opening to this gospel and an awesome, awesome depiction of who Christ is. The words beginning in chapter one, verse one, just leap out from the page and compel us to contemplate John's assertions about Christ. And through these words, it's John's desire to compel us as a result, as a response to this testimony, he wants to compel us to worship him, worship the Lord, to respond by committing our lives to living for him as Lord. There's no more profound opening statement in all of literature that could possibly be, be written. And such an economy of words here, and yet such amazing statements, and amazing statements that are perfectly made and must be perfectly made and packed with importance. And we'll see that as we work through these verses. And John 1 here, the prologue, beginning in verse 1 through verse 18, like the facets of a diamond. If you were to hold the diamond on a black background and turn the diamond in the light to see the, the colors in the diamond and how that prisms the light and separates the light and you see many different colors. And as you turn the diamond in the light to see many different perspectives on the beauty of that diamond, John here in the opening verses of John chapter one, hold up the diamond of Christ and he turns it in the light of his word for us so that we can see these different perspectives. And today, even in verse one, so many glorious perspectives on who Christ is. Christ, we'll see, is infinite. He is eternal. We think of Christ uh, as God to be infinitely wise, to be infinitely powerful. But here, described by John, he is infinite in duration. Uh, think about that for a moment and let that sink in. If you were to turn and look into eternity future, there you would see Christ without end. 
And if you were to turn and look into eternity past, there you would see Christ without beginning. He is without beginning and without end. Christ is eternal. And in our finite minds, we have difficulty contemplating someone with no beginning and someone with no end. But it's exactly what the Bible teaches. We turn to look into eternity, we see Christ. Christ transcends time. Christ is infinite. We with our finite minds cannot contemplate an infinite God. But the psalmist says, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. So Christ is infinite. Secondly, we'll see Christ as individual. Even though John here is asserting the deity of Christ, that Christ is God in the flesh, Christ is a distinct individual within the Godhead. At the same time, God, and at the same time, with God. And we cannot comprehend the Trinity. That's exactly what's being spoken of here, the glorious and unfathomable truth that is the Trinity. And thirdly, we'll see Christ as indivisible. Christ is indivisibly God. Though Christ is distinct from the Father, he is indistinguishable from God. He is distinct and yet indivisible. He is at the same time God and with God. That's difficult to comprehend in our own minds, but that's what the Bible teaches. Christ is infinite, Christ is individual, and Christ is indivisible. And we are to cry out with Thomas, my Lord and my God. But first, let's see Christ now introduced in verse one. Christ is introduced. So John in the prologue begins in verse one. In the beginning was the Messiah. Is that what he says? Are you guys awake? <laughs> in the beginning was, the, no. In the beginning was the son of man. No. In the beginning was the son of God. No. In a very thought provoking way, John says, in the beginning was the word. Now immediately with introducing Christ that way, John wants to build our understanding of who he is. The word here translates the Greek word logos. Now obviously that involves the spoken word. You speak a word, that word is spoken. Or those words, that word is an expression of thought. So you could say that the word expresses God or is an expression of God. But this word here comes loaded down with significance. When a first century Jew or Gentile might have been reading this passage, these opening verses, they would have thought word to be an impersonal force. And we're to see in these verses that the word is definitely not that. And it is so much more. Here, the word is a power packed word. So in the beginning, begins verse one. What does that sound like to you? Opening verses of Genesis, that's right. Anyone with a little Bible knowledge would have made that connection. Anyone having read these opening verses would make that connection. In fact, when John wrote this gospel, the book named Genesis that we know as Genesis was named in the beginning. That's what the title of the first book of the Bible was. In Genesis chapter one, verse one, the Bible reads, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Then God said, let there be light, and there was light. God spoke, and there was light. Through that creation account, God speaks, and creation leaps into existence. It is by the spoken power, the spoken word of God. In verse six, God said, let there be a firmament. And there was a firmament. In verse nine, let, then God said, let the waters under the heavens be gathered. In verse 11, then God said, let the earth bring forth grass and so on. God's word then in the beginning brought forth, brought out of it creation. God spoke and there was light. God spoke and there was creation. In creation, God's word, the word reveals his power. And so the first thing I want you to note about this introduction to John, introduction to Christ, is that the word reveals God's power. God's word then is God's power, his power in action. And I want you to see an example of that with respect to Christ. Listen to Hebrews chapter one, verse three. Hebrews chapter one, verse three says of Christ that he, Christ, the word, upholds or sustains all things by the word of his power. It's the word of God that reveals his power. So his word didn't only create, but now his word sustains all things and he sustains them in power. Notice I said that the, the word uh, is not a power, but that the word reveals God's power. This is not an impersonal force. This is not a power, 
This is an expression of God's power. We know the word here is a person. In thinking of the word, the person, the word is the omnipotent, all-powerful, creating and sustaining and working self-expression of the Godhead. You can consider the word in verse 1 of John's gospel, the creating and sustaining and working self-expression of God. That's who the word is. So this would have added nuanced understanding to passages like Psalm chapter 33 in verse 6 where the Bible says, By the word of the Lord the heavens were made, and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. In Isaiah chapter 55 verse 11, the Bible says, God says, So shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please, and it shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it. God's word signifies God in action and in power, working and doing. And Jesus Christ here in these verses is the personification of that word going out in power. Jesus Christ is the, the self-expression of God, the self-expression of the Godhead. And in this first point that we're looking at, this first facet of the diamond, this word reveals God's eternal power through creation, his eternal power through sustaining all things. And this aspect of the revealed word is sufficient to condemn all men who do not bow and worship this God. His revealed power in creation, his revealed power through that word, reveals his eternal Godhead and is sufficient to condemn all men for their failure to bow and worship God. In Romans chapter 1, verse 20, the Bible says this, for since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Even by knowledge of the creation, by a view of all that God has done in history, we can see that God is powerful and that he is eternally God and that we are without excuse. It says going on there in Romans chapter 1 that they knew God through this, and yet they did not glorify him as God, nor were they thankful. Now think about it for a moment. Through the centuries, we know this to be true, through the centuries, the sun, the heavenly bodies, the planets in our solar system, the planets, the stars in our universe, course through space in their orbits. Through the centuries, the seasons come and they go at their appointed times. Century after century, the trees produce leaves in the spring and drop them in the fall. Year after year after year, these things can con continue and no one can stop them and no one can undermine or thwart God's plan. All of this is an attestation of God's eternal power and Godhead. This is no impersonal force. This word is a person at work creating and sustaining all of this by the word who is my Lord and my God, as Thomas said. This is called, by the way, general revelation. General revelation. His creation, revealed by his word, is enough to prove to every person that God exists, that he is infinitely powerful, and that we are accountable to him. It is the atheist or the agnostic that wants to deny the existence of God by looking at creation and make up some alternative. We look at creation, we see a creator. And we are, by God's design, to see him high and lifted up, to see him as powerful, to see him in his eternal Godhead. However, Romans 1 goes on to say, because of our sin, mankind, we, are foolish in our thoughts. Romans 1 describes us as dark and foolish in our hearts. Now, we think we are wise, but Romans 1 says that we are fools. And we are described as dead in our sins and trespasses. And we are children of wrath, children of disobedience. Do you accept that description from God for yourself? God, who spoke the worlds into existence, also says that you are a wicked sinner, an enemy of God by your wicked works. And for that reason, general revelation, the knowledge of creation as being created by God is the entrance way, if you will, to knowledge to God. But general revelation is not enough to save you and that's not a deficiency on God's part in revealing himself to us. That's a deficiency is, that is found in the depravity of your own heart. 
a deficiency that you can't see God for who he is and that you can't respond due to sin the way that you should. We are without excuse. If we're going to be saved, we need more than general revelation. We need special revelation. And that special revelation comes through the word also. One, the word reveals God's power. The word is a living expression of God's power. Two, the word reveals God's saving plan. The word reveals God's saving plan. He, the word, is a living expression of life eternal. The word, the logos, reveals God as a speaking and as a revealing God. In Acts chapter 14, Paul says of God that he did not leave himself without a witness and in that he did good. We're not left to our own devices. We're not left to wonder what we're to do, what we're to believe, who we're to follow. And we are told clearly in scripture who we are to believe and how we are to behave, how we are to relate to him. God is not far off and God is not silent. God is not an impersonal force, but he's near, he's close, he's personal and he personally reveals himself to us. Listen to Hebrews one again, listen to Hebrews one. God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his son. God reveals himself in his word, has revealed himself to the fathers by the prophets, revealed himself in his word, and reveals himself in the word, the Lord Jesus Christ reveals himself in his son. And Jesus Christ here is the, the revelation of God's saving plan. Jesus said of himself that he came into the world to save sinners, to seek and to save that which is lost. Would you believe that revelation of God in Christ Jesus so that you might have life eternal? Jesus Christ is the revelation of God's saving plan. God didn't have to make provision for sin. He didn't have to do that, but he did. He chose to do that, and he chose to do that in the eternal word, Jesus Christ, by sending Christ into our world to take on the mud of humanity, to traipse through the garbage, the filth of this world, because he, God, desires to save sinners. God reveals that saving plan in Christ. Listen to 1 John chapter 1, verse 1. 1 John chapter 1, John, speaking of Christ again, says this, that which was from the beginning, the eternal God, that which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, John is an eyewitness, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled. Jesus Christ was there to touch. He says to Thomas, here, put your hand in my side. Feel the nail marks in my hands. They have seen, with his, seen him with their eyes. They've looked upon him. Their hands have handled concerning the word of life, the word of life. Jesus Christ is God's word of life, God's revelation of life. There is life in Christ. The Bible says that the wages of sin is death. And there is life in Christ. Christ is life, and that life is the light of men. In John chapter 1, verse 18, John says, No one's seen God at any time, but the only begotten Son, who is in the bosom of the Father, it's that son, it's that word, it's Jesus Christ who has declared him. And Jesus Christ has declared him as holy, declared him as righteous. He's declared him as just, calling all men into account. You will stand before the God who created the universe, before the God who created you, and you will give an account for your life. You'll stand before God on judgment day, and give an account of what you've done in the flesh, whether good or evil. You'll give an account to God. The Word, Jesus Christ, has revealed that there are none good, no, not one. The Word, Jesus Christ, has declared that according to God's perfect law, all of us are enemies of God, children of wrath, because we failed to perfectly keep His law. If you decided at this moment to live the rest of your life and never sin, could you? It's impossible. God's law designed, given by God to point us to Christ. It is to reveal Christ, the word to us that we might be saved. The law is to reveal your sin. You examine yourself in the light of God's law, you find yourself to be a sinner. There's no one that can keep God's law. But Jesus Christ came 
Jesus Christ perfectly kept God's law. Jesus Christ never sinned. And he goes to the cross as a perfect sacrifice for sinners to stand in your place if you'll repent and believe in the gospel. God desires that sinners should repent. That word, Jesus Christ, who declares the Father, also reveals the grace and mercy of God, the grace and mercy of God in Christ, revealing that in God's great patience, so far, you're living and breathing right now that so far, God has overlooked all of these years of ignorance. But now, as the Bible says, calls you to repent, calls you to repent and believe on him. And John says that he writes, so that believing on him, you may have life. Jesus was not only the first and most important word of the Father in the beginning, but he is also God's last saving word to you. There will come a time when the word will be rendered silent toward you. The Bible says that God will not always strive with men. There will come a time when God will be silent toward you. If you refuse to listen to him, he'll eventually judge you with silence. And you'll not find God apart from him. In him is life, and the life was the light of men. If you do not hear his last saving word to you through Jesus Christ, the last word that you'll hear from him will be the word of your judgment. You will stand before him. And Jesus said, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. His word to you on that day will either be, come, you blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from before the foundation of the world, or his last word to you will be, I never knew you, depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. God's word in Jesus Christ has gone out, and it's gone out in either mercy and grace or in judgment, and we are without excuse. The word, this word, the Lord Jesus Christ, is revealed here in John chapter 1, in the very first verse, revealed to us in three different ways, right? One way that he's revealed to us is that this word, the Lord Jesus Christ, is infinite. The second way that he's revealed to us is that he is individual, and the third way that he's revealed to us is that he is indivisible. So let's look first at Christ being infinite, the word being infinite. And here, infinite in duration. In the beginning was the word. Now, that statement, in the beginning was the word, is a statement reflecting the eternality of Christ, that Christ is eternal. And we don't see that necessarily uh, on the surface there. Think about it this way. There never was a time when the word was not. There never was a time when the word was not. When the beginning started, Christ was, the word was. When the beginning began, Christ was already present. There was a time when there was no universe. Uh, aside from evolutionists, there was a time when there was no matter. Matter is not eternal. The universe is not eternal. There was a time when there was no matter. There was a time when there was no time, when there was no space. And in that time, before all those things began, the word was. And Jesus was in the beginning. In the beginning was the word. Now there were there are several words here used in these first opening verses to describe those things that came into being. And they're described as coming into being, but Jesus Christ was. Verse 3, all things it says there, egeneta, came into being. In verse 3, without him, nothing came into being that came into being. It's using the same word there, came into being. It says of Christ that he was not that he came into being. All these things are said to be coming into being. Verse 6, there Egoneta came into being a man whose name was John. John, a man, came into being. But Jesus Christ, the Word, was. In verse 10, the world came into being. All came into being, but the Word was. And that word was there is a verb meaning to be. And it's in the imperfect. It means continually. It's continuously, continually to be, means to be. This speaks of the words pre-existence. The word, Jesus Christ, is interminable. He has no end. He is infinite in duration, no beginning and no end. He is eternal. He exists outside of time. That means that Jesus Christ was never created. By definition, if you were never created, if you were not created, if you're not a created being, by definition, you're God. And if you're God, you're eternal. When Christ speaks of his eternality, when Christ claims to be eternal, he's claiming to be God in the flesh. It's very interesting in, in looking at this 
that the Bible doesn't set out to prove that Christ is eternal or prove that God is eternal. It's simply a statement of fact from the scripture. And that's where we get clear statements, like in Psalm chapter 90, verse 2, for example, where the Bible says, Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, what? You are God. You are God. Listen to this from Micah. Now that's God. From everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Listen to Micah chapter 5, verse 2. But you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though you are little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to be ruler in Israel. Who is that that he's speaking of? Jesus Christ. He's speaking of Christ there. And then listen to what he says. Whose goings forth are from old, from everlasting. God is said to be from everlasting to everlasting. And here in Micah chapter 5, verse 2, Jesus Christ is said to be from everlasting. Jesus Christ is eternal. When Moses was commissioned by God to go to Pharaoh, Moses asked God, what name should I give them? Who should I said, say sent me? How did God reply? I am who I am. Thus you shall say to the children of Israel, I am has sent me to you. Now that is a statement of God's eternality. God is eternal. God has no beginning, no end. That is a statement of God's immutability, the fact that God never changes. It's a statement of God's faithfulness, a statement of God's constancy. It's a statement that God is outside of time and space, that God includes all time. But turn with me to John chapter 8. John chapter 8. That was said of God to Moses in the Old Testament. Look at what the Bible says about Jesus Christ, the Word in John chapter 8. And look beginning in verse 52. John chapter 8, verse 52, just a few chapters there to the right. Here the Bible says, The Jews said to Christ, Now we know that you have a demon. He's in an altercation here with the Pharisees. Abraham is dead, and the prophets, and you say, If anyone keeps my word, he shall never taste death. And Christ here speaking of eternal life. Look at verse 53. They ask him then, are you greater than our father Abraham who's dead and the prophets are dead? Who do you make yourself out to be? So Jesus answered them in verse 54, if I honor myself, my honor is nothing. It is my father who honors me of whom you say that he is your God. Yet you have not known him, but I know him. And if I say I do not know him, I shall be a liar like you, but I do know him and keep his word. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. This provokes a question on the part of the Pharisees. Then the Jews said to him, You are not yet 50 years old, and you have seen Abraham? And then Jesus said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. This is Christ's attestation that he is eternal God in the flesh. And they picked up stones to stone him. They didn't pick up stones to stone him because he was a God. Didn't pick up stones to stone him because he was a good example or an enlightened man. They picked up stones to stone him because Jesus Christ himself, from his own mouth, professed to be God in the flesh. And either that is a really, really bad grammar in that statement, or it is a very profound statement that Jesus Christ is eternal. Jesus Christ is God. It all starts with a very straightforward testimony of the eternality of God in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning, God, God preexistent. And then here in John chapter 1, verse 1, we see the same straightforward testimony of Christ. In the beginning was the Word, the eternal Word. By Jesus claiming to be eternal with God, he's claiming to have the same essential essence as God, the same essential nature with God. And again, we're confronted with John's purpose in writing that. He's claiming that Jesus is the eternal God who is infinite, all-powerful, all-wise, everlasting, unchanging, the one true and living God who is at the same time three persons. And he has come into his creation in human form to die as a substitute for sinners. And this is the foundation of the Christian faith. Let that sink in for a moment, that God who created the universe, who created you, came into the world, took on the form of a man, 
to die as a substitute for sinners? And can you live your life in light of that glorious truth without giving him the worship that is his due? This is the foundation of our Christian faith. Jesus Christ died as a substitute for sinners. And although he is eternal with God, he shares the same essence as God, Christ is also distinct within the Godhead. In that point too, Christ is individual. He's individual. The Bible says in John chapter one, verse one, in the beginning was the word, and here the clause we're gonna look at, and the word was with God. Now, from eternity past, there's been this glorious relationship within the Trinity, within the Godhead. You have God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, existing in an eternal relationship and union between themselves. And yet from all eternity, the members of the Trinity are distinct individuals. The word was with God communicates a couple of things. One, it communicates that Jesus Christ is an individual distinct from God the Father, distinct from God the Holy Spirit, and has a personal relationship with God. He has a personal relationship and he's distinct. So let's take a look first at his personal relationship with God. In his own person, within the triune nature of the Godhead, within the Trinity, one God in three persons, Christ, the Word, is the second person of the Trinity. One God, three persons. So what does it mean that the Word is personal or has a personal relationship with God? In the first century, when John was writing his gospel, it was prevalent, it was understood in Jewish thought and in Greek thought that the logos or the word was an impersonal force. Behind everything that we see was some impersonal force that held everything together. There was a Greek philosopher named Heraclitus in the 600s BC, and he was preoccupied with all the change, what looked like chaos in the world. And he said, this is the way he described the world, if you step into a river, all right, and the river's rushing by, you step into a river, you step out of the river, when you step back in, you're stepping into a completely different river. And that's the way he described life. Life at every moment is just constantly changing. It looks chaotic. And what Heraclitus said was that behind all of that chaos, there was some impersonal force, some principle, some law that held everything together, and he called it the word, the logos. In Jewish thought, the same idea that behind all the chaos of the world, behind the constant change of the world, there was this impersonal force that held it all together. The Stoics picked up on the same thing, some impersonal force behind everything. So people saw this non-personal, impersonal force in the universe to be the reason that everything was the way that it was. So John comes along now in John chapter one, verse one, and in the midst of this impersonal force stuff, John says that Christ, the Word, that the Word was with God, and this is a statement of a personal relationship. This is no impersonal force. This not only is a person, but this person is relational. He's personal to us. And he later says in verse 14 that the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. The Word here, therefore, is very personal. And he's very personal, but distinct from God the Father. That word with, we know that word to be a word that describes accompaniment. If I am accompanied my, by my Bible, my Bible is with me, right? My Bible is impersonal, but I can go somewhere with you, and that's a personal relation. That's a relationship. Literally, that word that's used there for with means face-to-face. -face. It's a relational word. It means that Jesus Christ, when it says was with God, was face-to-face -face with God, and it's got a sense of being at home, that Christ the Word in the Trinity was face-to-face -face at home with God. In that sense, it makes him very personal, uh, very relational. And we have that same sense with Christ. Now, the, the Jews at the time would have looked back at passages of Scripture in the Old Testament and would have seen things like wisdom or th seen things like God's power or the Word that was spoken to Jeremiah, the Word that was spoken to Isaiah, these words that were spoken to the prophets as having force. But in light of what John is saying here, we see that those words, God's working in the Old Testament, God's action, God's power, God doing in the Old Testament, very relational and done through the word. There's an example, we don't have time to turn there, but in Proverbs 8, listen to this description of wisdom. How can you come across with thinking that this is impersonal when it's so personally related? 
It says of wisdom, when he prepared the heavens, I, wisdom was there. When he drew the circle on the face of the deep, when he established the clouds above, when he strengthened the fountains of the deep, when he assigned to the sea its limit so that the waters would not transgress his command, when he marked out the foundations of the earth, then I was beside him as a master craftsman and I was daily his delight, rejoicing always before him, rejoicing in his inhabited world and my delight was with the sons of men. And just a passage like that would have been given brand new nuance when John here in chapter one describes the word, not as an impersonal force, but as a related, a relational, personal person, the second person of the Trinity. And it sounds like someone who was with God at the beginning in Genesis chapter one, verse one, doesn't it? When he was there created. When the Bible says that let us create man in our image, the, the Trinity there being plural. But next also, being God in the flesh, Jesus is distinct from the Father also. You have one God, but in three distinct persons, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. So he is distinct as an individual person. He has a relationship with God. He is eternal and eternally with God, but that presupposes that he is an individual and distinct from the Father. Of the same exact essence, of the same exact nature, and yet distinct. Distinct, and yet indistinguishable. And that is the, the unfathomable mystery of the Trinity. Can't understand it in our finite minds, but that's what the Bible teaches. And we as Christians believe what the Bible teaches. And it gives understanding again of the plural in Genesis 1, let us create man in our image. The third, the third point, Christ is infinite, Christ is individual, and third, Christ is indivisible. He is distinct from the Father and yet indistinguishable. He is a distinct person, and yet he is God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. And lastly, the Word was God. The Word was God clearly makes the point that Jesus Christ is Emmanuel, God with us, that he is God in the flesh. Now, you could say of that phrase that all that God was, the Word was. All that God was, the Word was. Jesus Christ was. God was the Word. If Jesus is eternal, existing outside of time and space, creating everything that's been made, then he must be uncreated himself. He is eternal the I am. And if he is uncreated, then he is God. That statement means that the Lord Jesus Christ, the eternal Word, was in all ways, in essence, in nature, in substance, very God of very God. Colossians chapter 2, verse 9 says, For in him, in the Word, in Christ, dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. So this again, this sort of caps off verse one with our understanding of the Trinity. One God, three persons. He is distinct from the Father, relational with the Father, and yet is God. God the Father, distinct from God the Son, distinct from God the Holy Spirit, and yet all three persons, God. And this is just a glorious mystery. You have heard the Trinity explained in many different ways. You could, uh, many people attempt to explain the Trinity by saying that uh, it's like the three phases of water, you know, gas, liquid, and solid. That breaks down, that analogy simply doesn't work. It puts you into heresy by using that analogy of the Trinity. Uh, it puts you into modalism. Uh, it simply breaks down, every human analogy breaks down. I've heard God described as being the sun, and God the Father being the Son, God the Son being the rays, and how they are distinct from one another, but the same, and that analogy breaks down, it just simply doesn't work. All human analogies just break down when trying to describe the Trinity. All we can say is it is one God and three persons, and that's exactly what the Bible teaches. Now let's look at that for a moment with respect to apologetics or how you would explain that to someone. And this is important. Notice in verse one, John did not say that the word was the God. That's a very important. To say that puts you in heresy. John did not say the word was a God. He couldn't have say, said that. To say that puts you in heresy. He did not say that God was with God. He couldn't have. To say that puts you in heresy. All results in heresy. So John, in saying this and describing this, is walking a bit of a tightrope here, and he communicates this Perfectly. 
There simply is no other way to say what John is communicating here to reflect the biblical truth of the Trinity. One God in three persons. All other would result in error on all counts. And John is avoiding saying something that is untrue on all counts. John's wording here is perfect. There's another word in Greek for saying that someone is divine-like, to describe someone as divine in an adjectival, an adjective kind of way. John could have used that word, but if he used that word, it would have put him in, put him in heresy. And so he doesn't use that word. He uses the word for God. And no one is picking up stones to stone Christ for being divine-like. They're picking up stones because Christ is claiming to be divine. So John didn't use that word. He uses the word for God. So if John intended to say that Jesus was a God, if John intended to say that, then John is a polytheist. He's saying that there are more than one God. And the Bible very clearly says that there's one God. There's one God in three persons. I know this is technical, but if you're evangelizing, you're talking to a Jehovah's Witness or a Mormon, you've got to get technical with the text. He's not saying a God. He's not saying the God in this verse. Jehovah's Witnesses and Mormons believe that because John didn't say that the word was the God and use the in there, they have to supply, put in the word a, that the word was a God. So they insert what is called an indefinite article, a there. They don't have to do that. It's not required in the text and it doesn't belong in the text. Again, that puts you in heresy. They believe that that object needs that article in front of it, and so they insert it themselves, and you get heresy. Now, in John chapter 20, when Thomas makes his exclamation, my Lord and my God, there's inserted in that exclamation an article. So John can put it in there when he wants to communicate that Jesus Christ is God, but Jehovah's Witnesses and Mormons can't supply uh, an indefinite article there. All this in John's order, he did not say that God is the word. And that's important because there's more to God than the word. There's also the Holy Spirit. But he says that the word was God. It's important even in the order. All this to say is very important the way that John communicated it. Throughout the scriptures, there are plenty of times when objects and predicate nouns are used without the article and in other places where they're used with the article. And so for a heretic to put an article in there is just uncalled for. John words this perfectly. That Jesus, the Word, was God. Jesus is God of very God and very man of very man. 100% God and 100% man. And Jesus was God in the flesh, the second person of the Trinity. God and yet in distinct person. There's also, time doesn't permit us to think of the theophanies, all of the examples, the appearances of God throughout the Old Testament. If God is spirit, and the Bible says that no one can see him and live, then who was it that walked in the garden in the cool of the day with Adam and Eve? The second person of the Trinity, God in the flesh. When Isaiah saw a view of God in the temple, in Isaiah chapter six, and he became undone, looking at the glory of God in the temple, his train, the, robe, the train of his robe filling the temple, who was it that Isaiah was looking at John chapter 12, verse 41, says that Isaiah in the Old Testament was looking at Christ. He was seeing Christ seated on the throne, the train of his robe filling the temple. Jesus Christ, communicated by John here, we're to see him as very God of very God, fully God, fully man. In this, Christ as God is indescribable, is matchless. The truth of the Trinity beyond our understanding the truth of Christ's eternality, God's eternal Godhead, his power, just matchless, unfathomable to our human minds, to our finite minds. So how are you, how, how am I, how are we to respond to these truths? This demands a response. John in writing, the Holy Spirit in writing demands a response. We're to respond with faith in Christ we respond with trust in him and him alone. Can you do enough good to work your way to heaven knowing that this God is perfect and holy and will not turn a blind eye to sin? 
Because God is just, every single sin must be paid for. God doesn't forgive like sometimes wicked people forgive and just sweep sin under a rug. God is just and God is holy. And being perfect demands justice for every sin. Will he expend that justice on you with his wrath for all eternity in hell? Or on your behalf? And as your substitute, will he expend that justice on his son? God desires sinners to be saved. He desires a redeemed humanity to worship him. And in the desire of God, he chose in his grace and in his mercy to us to redeem humanity by exerting his justice on his own son, his only begotten son who came into the world to save sinners. But he calls for our faith and trust in him alone, not in our own works. He calls us to turn from our sin and to commit our lives to living for him. If Christ is God, it means that his death on the cross for sin is of infinite value. He had to have been God to go to the cross. He had to have been God to pay the infinite cost of sin. He had to be God so that he could redeem sinners. And it's appropriate and acceptable because Jesus Christ is human. He represents us if you repent and believe the gospel. Just as Adam represented you in sin, and because of Adam, all have sinned, there is one greater than Adam, the second Adam, Jesus Christ, who came to be a representative for you if you will put your faith and trust in him to save you. And because he is sinless, because he is God, his sacrifice on the cross justified the justice of God expended the wrath of God against sin and took your place if you'll believe in him. Christ being God obviously means that his incarnation, his perfect life, his death on the cross, and his resurrection are extremely significant and we're to believe. Imagine those disciples who saw Christ, resurre- or saw Christ crucified and fled. And then something happened between the time that they fled and the time they went right back into the city of Jerusalem to preach Christ and preach Christ to their deaths. That was the resurrection. Christ was raised from the dead. And you have attestation from eyewitnesses in Scripture, eyewitnesses in history to say that Christ was risen from the dead and seen, here seen by God, seen by John. He himself became the one acceptable and sufficient sacrifice for sin. If you die without Christ, you'll spend an eternity trying to pay off your own sins in hell. Or you can believe on the Word, the Son of God, the second person of the Trinity, who died, came to die for sinners. You put your faith and trust in Him and live. And John gives evidence here for the fact that Jesus Christ is God. So that sinners might believe it and might commit their lives to follow Christ as Lord and Savior. He won't be your Savior without you submitting to Him as Lord. He is both Lord and Savior. Will you follow Him? Will you turn from your sin? Will you put your faith in Christ and have eternal life? It's the purpose for which John wrote. Would you honor Christ today by turning from your sin and following Him? Let's pray. My Father in Heaven, and we thank You for this opening, these opening verses in John chapter 1. And just the uh, with the depth and magnitude of these statements in verse 1 alone, God, how rich, God, how profound, how full and deep these truths are. There's so much more that could be said. There's so much more that your word does say. So I pray, God, uh, that you would just apply the, the truths of these statements to our hearts and our minds and or that we might view Christ more rightly, God, that we might view him in all his glory, all his majesty, the glory with which you gave him before the foundation of the world, and that sinners might look to him and be saved, might be converted, turned from sin, um, caused to be born again by your spirit, Lord, in serving Christ by faith. I pray for my brothers and sisters here, or those in Christ, that uh, they would be persuaded also of the truths of these verses in John, and they would be compelled, God, by your spirit within us, strengthened and motivated to live for Christ more fervently. 
uh, with our hope uh, in Christ, there will be a resurrection also. There's certainly a resurrection of the unjust or to condemnation, as the Bible says, but there will be a resurrection also of the just to eternal life. And we praise you, God, and thank you for it. Thank you for our time studying your word together. Lord, we love you. And we praise and worship you for these glorious truths, for all that you've done for us in Christ. It's in his name that we pray all these things. Amen.